Hey everybody, welcome back to another Tuesday tip where in this week's video we're going to be talking about modern BMX frame geometry and what all of the numbers that are used to build your frame actually mean. So if you're new here, every Tuesday I try to make a tips and tricks video on everything from learning about your bike itself to tips and tricks for working on your bike to tips and tricks for actual tricks while riding your bike. So like I said before, this week we're going to be talking about modern BMX frame geometry and what all of these numbers mean. Throughout the years, BMX frames have changed for a variety of reasons, a couple of those being just to fit the trends of the time or to make bikes feel better for certain disciplines, whether it be park, street, or trails, or for certain styles of riding. So to get right into what all of the geometry and numbers mean on your BMX frame, let's talk about the pieces and parts that make up a BMX frame, and we'll start from front to back, and that's how we'll talk about the numbers as well. So starting at the front, we've got the head tube, the top tube, the bottom tube, the seat tube, the bottom bracket tube, cable guides if you have them, chain stays, seat stays, brake mounts if you have them, they can also be on the chain stays, and dropouts. Moving our way back to the front of the frame, let's talk about head tube angle first. To measure head tube angle, you draw a line from the middle of the head tube, and then you draw a line from the middle of the dropout, and where they meet, the angle of that is your head tube angle. This is something that has a huge impact on the way that your bike feels and how certain tricks can feel while you're riding your bike. Generally, the numbers range from about 74 to 76 degrees with most frames falling somewhere in the 74.5 to 75 degree angle. So the way this works is the steeper the head tube angle, the closer the tire is to the rest of the bike and the easier and quicker it reacts as you turn the bars. And on the opposite side of the spectrum, the mellower the head tube angle, the further the front tire is away from the rest of the bike. Generally speaking, steeper head tubes help with things like nose manuals and other front end tricks, whereas mellower head tube angles help with things like trails and jumping. And that's because when your front tire is closer to the rest of your bike, your bars have a quicker effect when turning which is something that helps whenever you're in a nose manual or doing front end tricks. It gives you more control with those tricks. And with a mellower head tube angle, your wheels are further apart, which makes for less responsive turning, which is something that you want at the trails so that you feel like you have more control. Whereas when you're in a nose manual and you need to correct quickly, you'd want more of a responsive feel coming from a steeper head tube angle. When it comes to top tube angle on BMX bikes, we see everything from 18 inches up to 21 and a quarter to 21 and a half inches. Top tube length is measured using that same line that we drew through the middle of the head tube before, from that center point of the head tube to the center point on the seat tube. And this has to do with how comfortable it makes your bike feel. So it kind of goes hand in hand with how tall you are. But when it comes to the shorter top tubes, like 18 and 19 inches, we mostly see those in flatland. And then when you get into 20.5 to 21 inches, that's what we see more commonly when it comes to dirt, park, street, and trails and things like that. And like I said, those usually have to do with how tall you are, but a shorter top tube can do the same thing as a steep head tube and it can bring your wheels closer together, giving your bike a more responsive feel. And that's why we see park riders who are doing crazy spins and tail whips and things like that running shorter top tubes. And then when it comes to a longer top tube, it can do the same thing as a mellow head tube and it can spread your wheels apart further, giving your bike a less responsive feel so that it feels like you have more control and stability for things like trails. You can definitely tell when someone's riding a frame that's way too big or way too small for them because they're either hunched over to reach the bars or they're reaching really far to get to the bars unless we're talking about flatland where 18 and 19 inch top tubes are the norm. When it comes to down or bottom tubes, the length directly correlates to the top tube and seat tube. So there's really nothing to say about this because this generally isn't something that we change when working with BMX geometry. So we'll move right on back to the seat tube height, also known as standover, and the seat tube angle. 
For this video, I'm just gonna call it standover. And what this is, is the measurement from the center of where your top tube connects to the seat tube to the center of the bottom bracket. And on frames, this can range anywhere from six and a half inches at the low end to 10 inches on the top end. And really this is something that is up to the rider because shorter standovers are known for making things like tail whips easier. So this is another thing that you'll see a lot of park riders doing is having shorter standovers, whereas a taller standover could be known to be stronger. That's up for debate, but it's also something that can raise your seat up and make things like bar spins easier. I don't, it's really personal preference and everything to do with what you like and how you feel that it affects your riding. So now we'll move on to seat tube angle. This is measured using that same imaginary line that we drew from the center of the dropout up to the point where it meets the line going through the head tube. How you measure this is you have this line right here that goes from the back to the front and then you've got a line through the middle of the seat tube, the angle from the line on the seat tube to the line going from the back to the front, this angle that it creates is your seat tube angle. And we see everything from 69 to 70 to 71 degrees on the seat tube angle. Seat tube angle combined with other things such as head tube angle can change the way your bike feels because a steeper head tube angle combined with a steeper seat tube angle can make the top tube feel longer than it really is. Other than that, it's another thing that's up to personal preference and the way that it can change the look and the feel of your bike. Next, we'll talk about bottom bracket height, which is the measurement of how much higher your bottom bracket is than your axle to axle wheelbase. Generally, this is anywhere from 11.5 inches to 11.75 inches, with some frames being lower or higher than that number. This is another thing that you might not think has an effect on the way that your bike feels, but it's something that definitely does. A lower bottom bracket brings your whole bike closer to the ground, which is something that a lot of trail riders like because a lower bottom bracket makes your bike feel more stable and less twitchy, whereas on the opposite side of the spectrum, a higher bottom bracket can make your bike feel more twitchy or more responsive. So. This is another thing that's up to personal preference, but it does have an effect on the way that your bike feels. Another thing that can affect your bottom bracket height is your tire tread, believe it or not, because a bigger tire with bigger tire tread puts your axle to axle wheelbase higher, therefore bringing your entire bike and your bottom bracket height higher. Moving on from bottom bracket height, we can talk about the seat stays. This is another thing that is dependent on other aspects of the bike. So this isn't something that we typically change, but there is a seat stay bridge that is something that we change on custom bikes or some frames put their own seat stay bridge on there. This is one of the first frames to ever include one of these. This is the scavenger bridge, which is called the bridge because it's got a bridge going across the seat stays. So there's not much to talk about with this other than if your brake mounts are on here, sometimes they're removable or welded on, which is another preference that you can make or decide on when you're buying a frame. Some frames also don't even have brake mounts at all or the option for brake mounts. With that out of the way, we can move down and talk about chain stays. This is something that has a huge range on BMX frames, anywhere from 12.5 inches on the shorter end to 14 and a half or 14.5 inches on the longer end. Chainstay length is the measurement from the center of your bottom bracket to the center of where an axle would be in the dropout when it's slammed. And a slammed axle means that your wheel and your axle are as far forward in the dropout as possible. So again, that's the measurement from the center of the bottom bracket to the center of a slammed axle. This measurement directly affects your wheelbase from axle to axle and makes it shorter or longer depending on your frame, which has a big effect on the way that your bike can feel, which is why you see street and park frames with shorter chain stay lengths and trail based frames with longer chain stay lengths. A longer chain stay means that your wheels are further apart, 
which makes your bike feel more stable, it's harder to loop out, and it's easier to keep underneath of you while jumping at the trails. And obviously having a shorter chain stay brings your wheels closer together, which generally makes your bike feel more responsive and it has an effect on manualing and it can make bunny hopping easier. So if you ride everything from park to street to trails, you might wanna consider something in the middle of the road, which on a lot of frames is around 13.5 inches. But if you ride more street and park, then you do trails, you might wanna consider something shorter. And if you ride more trails, you might wanna consider something longer. All that being said, the last thing that we need to talk about with BMX frame geometry are the dropouts. So when it comes to dropouts, they can be deeper or shallower depending on the frame. So that's something that you're gonna to wanna to consider because the shorter the dropout, the less range you have in where you can put your wheel and your chain is something that can directly affect this. So if you have a shorter dropout and your chain stretches or the links just don't line up, you could be faced with a axle that sticks out of your dropout and you either have to buy a new chain or take a link out and maybe you have to put a half link in because an entire link puts it further forward than it can go and this is something that you definitely want to take a look at because it can cause a lot of frustration if you don't have the money to just go out and buy a new chain if things don't line up perfectly. With a longer dropout obviously you don't have to worry about that as much. There's also some technology that we can talk about with dropouts. Some frames have built-in chain tensioners and a chain tensioner is usually a bolt or a pin inside the dropout that you can tighten or loosen to not allow your axle to move forward any further. So it makes lining up your wheel a million times easier than doing it all by hand. But this is also something that can be bad because they can break or get stuck or something like that. I haven't had any bad experiences with them really, but I know that when you take off your wheel, sometimes you have to loosen them and then tighten them and it's just, it can be a pain to have them, but it also can help a lot to have them. So that's another thing that you wanna consider. Also, there are solid dropouts like this one or these ones that you can see where it's just one piece of metal or on like the Sunday frames, they have super thick dropouts that are hollow in the center, which are supposed to be stronger, but that's another thing that you can look at because a thicker dropout affects your axle and your wheel. And if you have a solid axle and a hub guard and all of these things, it can have an effect on how you put your wheel on your bike. And that's not something that you would generally think about when you're buying a frame. Other than that, there's a couple non-geometry specific things that we can talk about, such as another feature of this frame is the fact that there's no tube up here to put a seat clamp on. So you have to use, I think, animals wedge seat post is like the only one that you can use that's like modern you can't put a seat post clamp on here so you have to find some other way to do it there also used to be frames with built-in pivotal seat posts so you couldn't change the height of your seat at all without cutting it and figuring out a way to get a seat post in there i'm not sure if those are still around but it's worth mentioning and then the last thing that we can talk about it doesn't have anything to do with geometry but a lot of frames nowadays have head tube badges, and this is another thing about this frame is it's one of the first ones that had a head tube badge, and these are cool because, look at it. I mean, <laughs> it's pretty cool to have one of these on your bike, and there's a lot of custom designs for different bikes. FBM has some really cool head tube badges, so that's another thing to consider. I mean, I guess if that's something that has an effect on the frame you buy, um, it's just a cool feature that you can have on your bike. I just remembered a huge one that we haven't talked about yet. When it comes to chain stays, there's different methods of connecting the chain stay to the bottom bracket tube. Some frames are built so that both chain stay tubes weld directly to the bottom bracket tube, but there's other frames that are designed with what is called a wishbone design, where the chain stays come together into one tube that is welded to the bottom bracket itself. This is something that's said to be stronger. There's some frames like the barcode frame from Terrible One where there's wishbone designs on both the top and the bottom. There's also frames that have dual top tubes. There's frames with platforms. There's tons of things that you can get into when it comes to specific designs and features on frames as well as frames can have gussets on the inside 
or the outside of the tubes. A gusset is a piece of metal welded to the down tube or the top tube and then the head tube on a frame designed to add strength and just make it less likely for the frame to break in those places. And like I said, they could be inside the tubing, they could be on the outside, they could be in the middle, they could be on the top tube. Also, there's frames that have the top tube and the bottom tube connected with a gusset. And then there's frames like the Sunday Soundwave, like what I ride, where it's a huge gusset that goes down here, and then the bottom tube has a wave in it, and the top tube has a wave in it, and then there's a wave on the underside of the top tube, all meant to add strength to the frame itself and resist bending and dents like these on the bottom of the frame. So I think that about covers it when it comes to BMX frame geometry and other features to do with frames and their geometry. So hopefully I helped you learn about BMX frame geometry. I'm gonna keep saying it, BMX frame geometry. And I hope I didn't miss anything. If you like this video, consider subscribing. It's free and there's no reason not to. I wanna give a huge shout out to Kurt at BMX Union because almost all of this information came from his Insight article on the website about BMX frame geometry and I literally couldn't have made this video without it. It's a huge article and all of the information I talked about is in it and it would have taken forever to compile it on my own. So thank you, Kurt. Thank you, BMX Union. Thank you for watching. Remember to subscribe if you liked the video and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.